go into the findings of this study, I'll first define some key terms. The first term is phytophagous insects. These are insects that feed on green plants. They attack the leaves, the stems, the roots, the fruits, and they attack it at either the larval or adult stage. We don't necessarily include insects that feed on pollen or nectar, and these insects may feed on the plant either internally or externally. The next term we'll be defining is cannabis sativa. Cannabis is a genus of flowering plants uh, from the Cannabaceae family. It originated from the temperate regions of Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent, but through human migration can now be found throughout the world, including in Jamaica. Now, the Bloomberg market predicts that the cannabis industry will grow to US 50 billion by 2016. However, Jamaica is the first tropical country to relax its legislation on cannabis use for cultivation and medicinal research purposes. With this, there is little information regarding the pest plant relationship for us to understand how how the pest damage threshold will impact our economic benefits. Mayor 2007 stated that insects impact agricultural production by chewing on plants, leaves, sucking plant juices, borrowing within the root stems and leaves, and also by spreading plant pathogens. By spreading plant pathogens. Economists generally agree that insects consume or destroy up to 10% of the gross national product of, for industrialized companies and up to 25% for some developing countries. This, 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 however, can be argued, this 10% for developed countries can be argued to be due to the high use of synthetic chemicals. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not a model I would recommend for Jamaica. In fact, Jamaica is already associated with the heavy and uh, heavy and uh, Jamaica is already associated with the heavy and often improper use of synthetic chemicals. With cannabis often going through very little to no post-harvest processing and being used to treat medical conditions, this has serious negative implications such as neurological, reproductive, and dermatological effects. Among Ed Rosenthal, in his 2012 study, stated that Instead of striking out indiscriminately, it is best we target our effort and energy in uh, developing effective solutions. Effective solutions must be knowledge-based, and so we must understand the pest ecosystem surrounding the cannabis plant first. Amom et al. in uh, its 2015 study stated that most of the pest ecology and management information found on written and online sources were written by persons with no training in entomology or plant pathology. This has led to a pest, in, a pest management information base that is incomplete, unreliable, and often uh, completely incorrect. However, the reason for this is due to Cannabis use previously being prohibited for personal, medicinal, and research purposes as it was once classified as a Schedule I drug by the United States. Hence, in this research, 
we will be looking at, we will be observing the diversity and abundance of phytophagous insects that target cannabis at its vegetative and flowering growth stages, and also be looking at the plant insect injuries and its effect on the overall plant health. In executing this study, 60 healthy plants at, at the vegetative stage were transplanted to the UE Botanical Garden. They were planted in 1.5 by 2 meter plots and spaced 25 centimeters apart. Observations and measurement data were, collect were collected twice weekly for a period of 10 weeks. Nests and killing jars were used to collect insects and they were observed underneath a, a microscope for classification. Now, the results of, these, of, the, the results of this experiment were that a total of 24 insect families were observed during the flowering growth stage, uh, with 14 of them being present in the vegetative growth stage. It must be stated that insects within, this family, within these families have attained the pest status, and so it is necessary for us to look at them. And here we have pictures of the insect, uh, insects observed. And we also have pictures of the insect injuries observed. On the left, we can see root damage. And, also, and on the right, we can see insects, uh, damage caused by insects with sucking mole parts. With sucking mole parts. And at the bottom, we see in, uh, damage caused by insects with biting mole parts. They reduce the uh, photosynthetic area for the leaf, thus reducing um, the products of photosynthesis. It was also observed that the insect load was the most, was greatest for the flowering growth stage versus the vegetative growth stage, with the flowering growth stage experiencing 4,440 insects, insects, while the vegetative growth stage had 494. This is due to two main reasons. One, in, one insects being found, most of the insects being found having high turnover rates and high reproductive rates. And two, at the vegetative growth stage, the plant's biomass is greatly increased and so there is more surface area beneath leaves and beneath buds for insects to hide from natural enemies. The third finding was that seven insect families were most abundant. Aleroididae, Cicadellidae, Aphididae, Formicidae, Sciaridae, Agromycidae, and Noctuidae. With the exception of the Aphididae, the other insect families had very little, very significant variation in abundance between the vegetative and the flowering growth stages. And it also shows that the great increase in the large abundance of insects in the flowering growth stages due to the high reproductive rates of the aphididae. And so in conclusion, there was great diversity of insect families associated with cannabis sativa at the flowering growth stage versus the vegetative growth stage with a significant value, significant value of 0 0.022. There was also greater overall abundance of insects associated with the flowering growth stage compared to the vegetative growth stage. The most, the most abundant insect families observed were the Aleroididae, Cicadellidae, Aphididae, Formicidae, Sciaridae, Agromycidae, and Noctuidae. And the presence of these families were confirmed from research conducted by Lego and Stanford in 1989 and McPartland in 1995. In concluding, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Peter from the Life Sciences Department, whose efforts has, has, has affected the success of this study, and thank you. Thank you very much, Tony Ann. I think we have time for about two questions from the audience, if there are any. Um, very interesting, but I wonder what measures have you tried um, other than the standard um, 
chemical interventions. Have you tried any natural um, product interventions to control MV space, or you you were simply concerned with um, with the metrics? Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Good question. This study was simply concerned with uh, studying the insect incidence and the pest ecosystem surrounding the cannabis plant for us to go forward and then develop an integrated pest management program, which would include the use of organic products. Um, but for this study, we did not apply any form of uh, pesticide or fungicide on the plants. They were allowed to grow so we could observe what insects would target the plant naturally. But if you'd like to know about organic products that could be used, um, there are neem oil, there are a number of products that could be used to naturally reduce pest load. Oh, yes. Right, so. If you care to. So going forward, we could definitely test different products um, and their efficacy in controlling different pest families. Uh, good morning. Good presentation. Wanted to know if you found any insects that were unique, particularly to the marijuana plants. Uh, well, different insect families are uh, attracted to different plants based on the plant terpenoid qualities. Um, but to say there were any unique insects that, you know, a target cannabis and have never really been seen targeting other crops, I cannot say that. And so a general, a normal farmer would see these same insects and think that they can use the same synthetic chemicals they use on their other crops on the cannabis and that will have sim um, a lot of health implications. Tony, and do you assume that all the insects are pests, or were there any insects which might be beneficial for the crop? Uh, there are a number of insects observed. The, the study was on those that would be pests, but I did see um, insects that supported the activities of pests, um, such as for you know ants that would carry scale insects, um, and I did see a few natural enemies as well such as wasps, um, pentatomidae, which uh, generally target leaf miners. So there were other insects observed, but I would say because the environment was also a bit built up, you might, you might not get the n diversity that you'd see in a rural setting. Insects always get a bad name. Just wanted to remind you, but some of them can be beneficial. Thank you. Right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Toyan. So next we have Reason Smith, and she'll be talking about the geology of the Hanover block. And I know that it seems that Tony Ann's work was generating quite a bit of interest. Thankfully, she's still um, with us here in the audience. But maybe after the session, you can pose some further questions. I'm sure it'll be um, well appreciated and most helpful. In the interim, while Reason gets herself ready, it's quite nice, I think, to have our undergrads um, presenting here today. It gives them quite a nice bit of exposure and experience um, in presenting their work and also, hopefully, lots of encouragement. I s I'm joining grad school eventually, yes. They, 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 they are our targets, yes, primary targets. I see that there is a, a change in who I thought was a speaker which looks like Rizan is ready. Hello. Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, we are OK. OK, so join me again, ladies and gentlemen. Let's welcome Rizan and her presentation. <laughs> OK, good morning. My presentation will be on the paleogene geology of the Hanover Block, Western Jamaica. Now, the 
main aims of this study was to map the formations to create a geologic map of the Jerusalem mountain in Lyre, to understand the structural geology, as well as to determine the relationships between the formations as well as the structure. The structure. No. The a quick definition of an inlier. This is basically some older rocks which are surrounded by younger rocks. So the setting of the area of study was located in the Jerusalem mountain and it was located in western Jamaica on the Hanover block. This is one of numerous Cretaceous inliers which are found throughout Jamaica. It is also located south of the Lucy inlier and throughout the study no detailed notes of all crops were collected as well as strikes and dips taken. Additionally, samples were collected and thin sections were made from these samples. Now, at the end of the study, this is the geologic map which was created to show the relationships as well as the formations. Now here to the south, you have the actual inlier and to the north here, we have another inlier, some formations from another inlier and here would be the tail of the chain of younger rocks. The study area consisted of nine formations in total, ranging from the Dias Formation, which is about 83 million years old, to the Montpelier Formation, which can range up to 5 million years old. Here this table just shows the formations in the area, the ages, as well as the groups and the paleontology, which were found. First off, the Dias Formation. Now this is a formation from the Lucy and Lyre, and it consists of interbedded gray-brown gray shales and well-sorted sandstones. The thicknesses of the individual beds, which you can see right here, range from 10 to 17 centimeters in total. Now, throughout the entire study area, the shales or the mudstones here, they were highly deformed and fractured, which indicates that there's a lot of tectonic stresses occurring. And at the end of the study, it was, it was interpreted to have been deposited in a deltaic environment. The mint formation. This is the oldest formation at the, in the Jerusalem mountain in Lyre, and it consists of fine to medium grain, well-sorted red sandstones. In the solving section of the study area, which was here, oh there. Ah, in the solving section right here, it consisted of pebble, class-supported pebble conglomerates. Within the red sandstones, there were several laminations which were observed and it's interpreted to have been deposited in a lower course fluvial system. The Thicket River Formation. This lies above the mint formation and it consists of interbedded mudstone and crystalline limestones. Now within these beds, several rudis, which are an, ex which are an extinct genus of mollusk, there are several such as the Trachmonites rudissimus and the Titanosarcolites species. It's, uh, it's been interpreted to have been formed on a carbonate platform, and it has a thickness of approximately 45 meters. As you can see here, this is a vertical cut through the Titanosarcolites rudis. The Bellow Formation. This lies above the Thicket River Formation, and it consists of gray mudstones. It was, however, very poorly exposed throughout the study area, and it represents tidal deposits. Jerusalem Formation. This is the final formation in the Jerusalem Mountain in Lyre, and it consists of massive gray bedded grain stones with brown carbonate mudstones. It contains several fossils such as foraminifers, the Electronaria oysters, as well as the phyl Phylocanthus echinoid. The echinoid is seen up here. Now this formation in various literature has been referred to as the Electronaria beds or the Lofa oysters of the Jerusalem Inlier. It's also interpreted to have been formed in a shallow water environment and it has a minimum thickness of about 50 meters. Now onto the Paleogene formations. The Chapelton formation. This is 
of formation from the yellow limestone group, and it consists of massive nodular fossiliferous gravestones and muds. It consists of echinoid radials, gastropods, bivalves, and bryozoans, as well as some foraminifers. Now, up here, this is a large ga gastropod called Campanale, and throughout the entire study area, there were two large ones which were recovered, and the largest one ranged up to 48 centimeters in size. It was really large. And here it shows in the Chapleton Formation, there was evidence of lots of diagenesis, which is basically post-depositional alterations. And this was observed through the thin sections which were created. It's also interpreted to have been formed in a shallow water carbonate platform. Now, these are just some images of the Helicostigena forum, which you just saw. And these are some horizontal cuts of it. The Somerset Formation. This is a formation from the white limestone group, and it consists of massive pink, foraminiferal, poorly washed light pack stones, which contain the foraminifera fabularia versae, which can be seen up here. It has a minimum thickness of 40 meters, and it has been interpreted to have been deposited in a carbonate platform. Now, the interesting thing about this formation was that there were mudstone class, which you can see right here, which were found within the formation. The Brownstown or Moniac formation. This is also from the white limestone group, and it consists of white pack stones to wax stones containing the Lepidocyclina and Dosophora manifera, as well as some gastropods. It has an approximate thickness of about 60 meters and it was also interpreted to have been formed in a shallow water carbonate platform environment. Now finally, the Montpelier Formation. This also belongs to the white limestone group and it consists of white, soft, bedded carbonate mudstones. It consisted of several planktic foraminifers as well as lepidocyclinas. And it's been interpreted to represent deep water facies. Now the structural geology. After the map was constructed, there were several cross sections which were done. The first one along line A, A prime, B, B prime, and C, C prime. Now starting from the top, along this first one, it shows that within the study area there are, there are three unconformities. The first one showing the Brownstown Armoniac Formation, which lies unconformably above the Somerset Formation, which in turn lies unconformably above the Chapleton Formation. Now the third unconformity comes under the Chapleton, uh, based on literature. The second cross-section across B, B prime, shows the structure of the inlier and the relationship of the inlier and the surrounding rocks, which are, as you can see, it's faulted against the inlier. And the final one just shows the, the um, paleogene formations faulted against some formations from the inlier as well. Throughout the study area, there's extensive faulting and deformation, which result, which was as a result of movements along the Northern Caribbean plate boundary. As a result of this, there's extensive fracture throughout not only the Dias formation, but throughout the in all of the formations in the area. Based on missing limestone, white limestone sequences, it's been interpreted as unconformities within the area. And the, north, the northwest, southeast, and the northeast, southwest faults, these are the ones which brought the paleogene formations into direct contact with the in liars, the deformations from the inlier. Additionally, at the southern section of the map area, the Miocene Montpelier formation, it was brought into contact with the inlier via a fault. Now this just shows one of the faults which is observed through the study area. You can see it comes right down 
a long hair. No. In conclusion, a proposed geologic history. This began with the deposition of the Dias Formation in the Campanian, which was then followed by the deposition of the formations of the Jerusalem in Lyre, and the Maastrician, which is the late Cretaceous, Cretaceous, followed by uplift and decoration. This was then followed by the Chapelton Formation being deposited, and there was uplift and erosion, which brought it into contact, into direct contact with the older Dias Formation. Following this, there is deposition of the Somerset Formation. However, contrary to what was previously believed, based on the mudstone class which were found in the Somerset Formation, this indicates that there was subaerial exposure throughout the Eocene, which goes against what was previously thought. Following this, there was deposition of the Brownstown Ammoniac Formation in the Oligocene. Now, based on several missing limestone sequences between the Chapelton and the Somerset and the Brownstown and Somerset, this is, this is interpreted as several unconformities. And then finally, the creation of troughs and rifts associated with the opening of the Cayman Trough in the Miocene resulted in the deposition of the Mount Pelier Formation. So these are some references which were used throughout the study. And special thanks to my supervisor, as well as to the Department of Geography and Geology. And thank you. Thank you very much, Reason. Uh, any questions from the audience? We have time for, again, no. maybe about no. two. No. 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 <laughs> OK, thank you very much again, Reason. I would like to invite the final speaker, or speakers. Well, I would assume it's one, right? There's a group of you. Come there. And while these guys are setting up, um, these last two presentations have reminded me of why I love computing so much. Although we, by at some point in time, end up knowing quite a number of languages. Thankfully, one of them is not Latin. So this group will be talking about providing taxi services using a customer-centric approach. And it is a group of students that will be making this presentation. I'm anxious to see how they're going to go about doing it. But it looks like it also has some aspect of computing involved, so I'm even more excited. So without um, further delay, please join me in welcoming Saren Wilson, Shona K. Vassiana, Jonathan South, and Andre Edwards. Interesting. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This morning we present to you, on the go, providing taxi services using a customer-centric approach. Our software engineers are Andre Edwards, myself, Jonathan South, Saren Wilson, and Sean K. Vassiana. So, currently in Jamaica, our transportation systems are not at their optimum level. They are deemed to be inefficient, unsafe, and also very time consuming. Now, it was reported in December 2016 by the Gleaner that a number of well established taxi services in the corporate area of Jamaica have actually admitted to dispatching illegitimate taxis to collect their passengers when they're asked to be booked for a job. No, here is on the go. Now we're here to try to alleviate this problem and to decrease the various pain points of the poor transportation systems to be more specific or taxi systems. Now on the go is a taxi service website that is an innovative model that is geared towards various aims and goals to help to alleviate this problem. Now we have various methods in place and processes to help to alleviate the tedious sign-up processes to actually book a taxi by offering a quick start option. We also provide the client with the quickest and the most efficient driver for that client. And we also provide the client with driver information and also vehicle information before the actual job is booked. Now from here, now that we have our project definition and our problem definition, we'll go through our project scope. All right. So we'll delve into our functional requirements. But firstly, on-the-go facilitates four types of users. 
registered clients, quick start clients, drivers, and an administrator. The functional requirements are as follows. The system allows a client to request a taxi, create a profile. It allows a registered client to do the same as listed above. However, he has additional functionality to view past jobs, rate their driver, and review their driver. The system allows a driver to action a job request from a client, meaning he can accept or decline this request. He can view traffic reports and he can change his status. The system also allows an administrator to generate user profiles for these drivers, update their profiles, manage the vehicle inventory, monitor a taxi, manage the best driver variables, and pull these taxis. As it relates to our non-functional requirements and the performance criteria, the map displaying available drivers will load within five seconds. The system should pull the driver's location every X minutes. X is just a representative of whatever value the administrator would put there. So for instance, the system would pull the driver every five minutes, whatever the administrator set for X. As it relates to security, as you know, in today's society, malicious attacks and hacking is a very prominent problem. So on the go actually encrypts all passwords using our system. The, loca the location, and finally, the location of our users is not obtained without the user's permission. Okay, so similar offerings to on the go are Ride Jamaica and Uber. And based on these, we implemented an estimated time of arrival system and a vehicle inventory system. But what makes on the go separate from these are that we allow a user to be able to sign up and, no, we allow a user to be able to quickly and easily get a taxi without having to go through a lengthy sign up process. And we can use a previous job to create a new job. And we allow, in future iterations, people will be able to use our system without having to use the internet. All right, with this, we go into our design decisions. For the design decisions, there were a number of tools that we used. These tools would have been able to allow us to design from con the conception of the idea through to the end. We used PHP, JavaScript, Ajax, HTML, CSS, among others. All right, so here we have an activity diagram. What this is supposed to do is that it's supposed to give you an idea of the flow of a particular aspect of the system. For this, we chose to represent a taxi request. So here what we have is a user would choose a taxi request. After this, they would be able to either enter their location or they'd be able to use their device to find their location. Once this is done, the list of available taxis is given to the client. They can do two things with this. They can look at details for this driver, and they can do that for multiple drivers. What they will be able to do after that is they will be able to select a particular driver and send a request to that driver. Once they've, they've done this, it's time to wait, because the driver can either accept or decline. Yes, decline, and will explain decline the request. If it is that the request is declined, the client can select another driver, or if it is that the request has been accepted, they'll be able to send a job information form which captures some of the important information to the driver. Now for our best driver algorithm. Now the best driver algorithm is the core of our system and it, it provides the main functionality for on the go. Now, to start, a client will first enter their location. A client can enter their location by actually typing in the location or using our Find My Location feature. From here, once they type in their location, a geocoder is used to translate that string literal to actual latitude and longitude coordinates. If they choose to use a Find My Location feature, a Google Map API is used to find the latitude and longitude of the device that the client is actually viewing the website on. From here, we get the client's location. After we've gotten this, we look at the taxis that we have in our database. We filter this list of taxis by availability. Now a taxi or a driver can be available or unavailable. Once we filter by all the available taxis, we filter it by a predefined range or vicinity that is set by our administrators. Once all the taxis meet this criteria, we calculate their estimated time of arrival from where they're located right now to where the client is located. We use this by using the average speed once again set by our administrators, the client's location and also the taxi location. From here, we provide the client with a map that has the client location, the taxis, and they're placed on the map in their various locations. 
We also provide them with a list of the available taxis in that vicinity that is sorted by ratings. Now, each driver or taxi can have a rating from one star to five star. With this list and this map, the client can now see further details of each driver that they select, including driver details and also details of the vehicle that they are assigned to at that time. Now, with all of these various conditions, the client can choose the best or the most suitable driver for them and for their driving experience and request this driver. Our current limitations for on the go are that it is currently reliant on the internet and we are reliant on Google APIs, but in future iterations, we hope to be able to not rely on Google APIs. All right, so as with any system, there are a number of there are a number of benefits that we have, and you will see these exhibited in the screenshots that are to follow. However, just to go ahead and to give you some idea for benefits, someone is able to request a taxi without signing up by using our quick start. So a quick start feature can also be used by someone who is registered. If they can't bother with the hassle of actually signing into the system, they can just request from there. However, there is a benefit of being registered. If you are a registered client, you'll be able to use information from a past job to fill out the job information form without going through the process again. On the go is accessible from a wide range of devices, cell phones, laptops, tablets. That's convenience right there. Also, for drivers, we said they can decline jobs. This is a part of our safety mechanism. If there is a shootout going on in a particular area now, we will not force the driver to accept a request in that area. It's for their safety. And of course, our client safety comes first. So for clients, they're allowed to see the driver information and vehicle information before making a choice of a taxi. Now to quickly go through the actual process of using on the go, once a quick start client, as we like to call it, goes onto our website, they'll be viewed with They'll be greeted with these various screens and they'll go through the process of booking a taxi, requesting the driver. They'll be able to log in, sign up, they'll see the estimated time of arrival and the various things that we mentioned before. So this is just a feel of what the actual system looks like now. And before we go into questions, I'd like to take the opportunity to say special thanks to Dr. Carl Beckford. He has been our supervisor through the life of this project, and uh, he inspires us to keep going day by day and to put our best foot forward. I'd also like to thank Professor Kaur and Dr. Focum for acknowledging our work so that we could be able to share it with you today. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, again, any questions from the audience? Yes, we have one. And thanks for the presentation. On the go, have you considered this? Like you're at Santa Terrace, you order two taxis, and you decide after you they have made a decision to cancel one of the taxes. I noticed you say a taxi, but a situation when you ordered. Um, like you have a forum like this, and you order four taxes to take persons to four different locations and all. But for some reason, when perhaps the taxi on the go, you have to cancel two because the transport turned up for two of them that you never anticipated. But before the taxes arrive, you have to cancel two from the send, from on the goal center. All right, I think I'll be the one taking this question. In the specific scenario that you gave us, we, what we have done so far is that if it is for an individual who is going through our system and selecting, we have it so that they'd select one taxi. So say I'm just impatient and I want three taxis because one said two minutes, one said three minutes, and one said five. We would only allow you to select from the list one taxi. 
We're trying to provide the quickest available service to our clients, as well as we are attempting also to fulfill all our clients' needs. In the case where all the taxis are coming to one setting, such as a forum like this, and in the middle of it, you decide, oh, we don't need that many taxis, we've got this covered, you would be able to call in to us, as there's no feature as yet for persons to indicate that using the internet. But the beauty of it is that we have so many ways to communicate, and we can integrate multiple ways. All right, so my question is, you said that you will calculate the estimated time based on the location of the client and the location of the driver. At this point, is there any way to um, include or to account for traffic? All right, so currently, we didn't get to show it in depth, but each driver has the ability, and also the administrator has the ability to see various traffic reports from the NWA. We take, because we say it's an estimated time of arrival, we do try to take the traffic reports into consideration but the estimated time is calculated based on the client's location in latitude and longitude, the taxi's location in latitude and longitude, and the average speed that the administrator sets. So that's how we calculate it. You know, it's an estimated time. So it wouldn't necessarily be the most efficient or optimum time, but it's the best time that we give. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Um, thank you very much. Interesting talk, and we, and we actually... Um, do need the service, right? But I'm, I'm sure you are aware of, of Uber and Lyft, right? And there's always this um, security safety issue. Um, one thing I don't like is that you would allow someone to use your system and not register. Safety for the driver as well is important. So a quick start mechanism, I think, is an issue. I just had a question about the star rating of the taxis. It, would it be also be linked to price? Because if not, the people are always going to choose the ones with the higher star, and the lower stars are never going to get any work. Again, I've been chosen to take the question. All right. Um, in terms of the rating for now, what we have done is we have determined rating, we would like to determine rating solely on the experience. So in terms of costs and pricing, as you can see, we've tried to negate that for now. The reason for that is in Jamaica, prices with taxis are very interesting. Where I am from, I'm, I'm not from Kingston, where I'm from, if you take the taxi outside this door, you pay one price. But if you come on the same taxi at the door at the back of the room, it's a totally different price. In Kingston, things are a bit more standard per se. So if you get on a JUTC bus at UA and you decide to come off at Ligony, you pay $100. If you go into halfway tree, you pay $100. So pricing was something that we didn't want to try to standardize in an initial iteration of our system. So we didn't really want to base ratings on that. We wanted to limit it for now to the customer experience. OK, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you all for attending this session and for your attention and your questions. Before you leave, a member of the organizing committee would like to make an announcement. Thank you. Um, colleagues, uh, before you go uh, on break, uh, stop by the table and pick up a ticket for lunch. Um, like the lunch. Um, break is up to 11.20, and then we'll have parallel sessions. Um, there's one on health and environment, uh, which will be in SLT2. And um, in here, uh, there will be one on biodiversity. Um, if you also have time during the day, you can um, 
stop by and see what the girls in ICT event looks like at the Mona Visitors Lodge. Thank you.